Welcome to the Assembly Committee on Government Affairs. Will the Secretary please call the roll? Assemblyman Carter? Present. Assemblyman DeLong? Present. Assemblyman De Silva? Here. Assemblywoman Duran? Here. Assemblywoman Gonzalez? Here. Assemblyman Gurr? Here. Assemblyman Hibbets? Here. Assemblyman Koenig? Here. Assemblyman MacArthur? Here. Assemblyman Wynn? Here. Assemblywoman Taylor? Assemblywoman Thomas? Here. Chair Torres? Here. Welcome to the audience here in Carson City as well as the audience in Las Vegas. And we actually have an audience in Las Vegas today and our committee is very excited about that. Um, and those of you joining us uh, via teleconference, uh, please, uh, I just have a couple housekeeping reminders. Please remember to silence your electronic devices. If you wish to testify, please make sure you sign in at the table by the door and provide a business card to the committee secretary. For those joining online, please be sure you mute your microphone when you are not speaking to minimize any background noise. When testifying, please turn on the microphone and clearly state your name and affiliation, if any, for the record. Then turn the microphone off each time you are done speaking. Handouts. As a reminder, please make sure you have 20 hard copies for members of the public. Electronic copies should have submitted to our committee manager by noon yesterday for members of the committee. We expect courtesy and respect in our interactions during the meeting, even if we may not agree with another person's position. Committee members will be using their laptops to view handouts and other documents. Please do not view this as a sign of disrespect or inattention. Public comment will be taken at the end of the meeting. Each person will be limited to two minutes. In addition, the public may submit written testimony to the committee up to 24 hours after the hearing. We also have a new timer thing. Um, so for those of you joining us here in Las Vegas, um, I, or here in Carson City, I forget where I am. Um, when you come and testify um, at, for the, just like I, either on a bill in support, opposition or neutral, or um, at the end during public comment, it'll just time us it for us for the two minutes, which I think is just so much easier than me trying to time it on one of the many electronic devices up here, um, and you trying to remember how long you have left. Um, so hopefully this is uh, helpful. We'll test it out for a week or so and see if we like it or if it's just a nuisance. Um, so today we are going to have somebody who used to sit on our committee. Welcome back to the Assembly Committee on Government Affairs. We're going to have a presentation with the Office of the State Controller, Andy Matthews. And I know that uh, and I know that uh, the, the Controller Matthews is going to try to use the word control as much as possible in his presentation today. And at the table here in Carson City, we have the Chief Deputy Controller, James Mack. Thank you, Chair, and good morning to you and to, to all members of the Assembly Committee on Government Affairs. Uh, very nice to be with you this morning. A lot of fond memories uh, of this committee, and no doubt, Chair, you've got things well under control uh, now that you are the one with the gavel. Uh, I'm Andy Matthews. I have the honor of serving as Nevada State Controller. We're going to provide a little bit of an overview of, of our office for you. This morning, I'm going to start with sort of um, some big picture uh, information and then Chief Deputy Controller James Mack, who is with you in Carson City, is going to talk a little bit more detail. Uh, the State Controller, uh, as many of you know, essentially serves as the uh, state's chief fiscal officer, one of our six statewide elected constitutional uh, officers. Um, our office is basically divided into four sections, financial reporting, debt collection, fiscal operations, and IT. We have a total of 45 team members in our office, two non-classified and four, uh, 43 classified state employees. And I just wanted to take a moment uh, to acknowledge and to thank uh, all of our incredibly hardworking team members in the State Controller's Office. As I continue uh, to get to know them, uh, I continue to be amazed and inspired by the level of talent and dedication that we have among our team members in the office. So a big thank you to everyone. Um, among our responsibilities in the State Controller's Office, we control the state's accounting system and process the state's daily transactions. We prepare the annual comprehensive financial report, commonly referred to as the ACAFER, as well as the popular annual financial report. Uh, we prepare the financial statement for the permanent school fund. We conduct reviews of agency financial tra uh, transactions. We administer the state's debt collection program as well as the state's vendor database. We ensure compliance with state fiscal and federal revenue laws. And of course, we look to identify waste and inefficiencies within state government. 
And with that, I will turn things over to Chief Deputy Smack. Thank you so much. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, James Smack, Chief Deputy Controller, uh, Office of the Nevada Controller. I will start a little bit of talking a little bit about our financial reporting team. This is the team that we have 11 members on. It, we, this is the team that prepares the annual comprehensive financial report, the ACFR. If you hear me refer to it as a CAFR, that name change happened a couple years ago. I was in this position for four years under a former controller. I'm used to calling it a CAFR, so please understand that those acronyms may be interchangeable as I give testimony, so I apologize in advance for that. We also prepare the financial statements for the Permanent School Fund. The Government Accounting Standards Board, GASB, has issued several new accounting standards due for implementation in the current fiscal year. This list will likely grow by three to five additional standards by fiscal year 25. Usually we have at least three we have to implement on an annual basis, sometimes sometimes as many as five or even, even six or seven if the GASB is feel, feeling um, particularly randy that year. Um, the five statements, I can certainly provide additional information on it. I mean, GASB 98, I like to refer to as the, the uh, GASB that changed the name permanently to the Annual Comprehensive Financial Report because some states were calling it a CAFR, some states were calling it an ACFR. GASB decided to, uh, in their infinite wisdom, that Statement 98 would uh, solidify that as a part particular name change. So the other ones are a little bit more complex. As we move on into the debt collection section, our debt collection team has four team members. In fiscal year 2017, our office implemented a new debt collection system called NCIS, Nevada Collections Information System. Um, I'm still waiting for Mark Harmon to show up, but he hasn't yet. So average annual collections pre-implementation was $266,018 $266, per fiscal year. Since we brought that system online, the average has increased to $1.285 million per fiscal year. This average collection amount has stabilized over the past six years since the implementation of NCIS. Total number of state agencies we've collected money for has increased from 37 to 48. We're currently working with Dieter on establishing a garnishment process, which should increase the annual average. Our office is also coordinating with other state agencies to not allow state licensing for those individuals or companies that owe the state money. Funny thing is, when they can't get their license, they sometimes they tend to contact our office and figure out what they can do to take care of that debt. So. It's kind of nice to have that stick. Uh, we use internal collection methods and also con contract with outside collection agencies to collect state debts. Our web portal allows debtors to pay their debts online via credit card, and our goal is to increase the fiscal year collections to $2 million by the end of year fiscal, end of fiscal year 25, combination of the DEDER inf interface, and we are also have requested an additional position for this section. Information technology, IT for short. Our team has nine team members. Our primary focus will be transitioning the Advantage Dawn Discover Vista programs over to SAP, part of the uh, Smart 21 package, um, part of the Smart 21 program. For those of you that have heard of Smart 21, 21 refers to the 21st century, so we still have 77 more years to get this implemented. It won't take that long, I promise. Doing away with all the out-of-date and soon-to-be-out-of-date IBM soft hardware, uh, provide support to state agencies, coordinate new initiatives with the Advantage Accounting System. One initiative um, in particular that I recall when I was in chief deputy position before was helping DMV with their transition to a new credit card, um, credit card system and having that system be able to communicate with our Advantage Accounting System so they didn't have to input those, input those processes manually on a daily basis. So transitioning our SEO internet over to SharePoint replacing our bottom line check printing solution with an easier to use and manage solution. And I say one better support because the last time we had a major support item out with bottom line, it took them two years to get back to us. So we are hoping we could find uh, a solution that will get us support maybe in more like two days or maybe two weeks as opposed to two years. That would be, that would be quite the accomplishment. Uh, upgrading our office phone systems to work with Microsoft Teams, that'll save us a little bit of money on long distance costs and, and the like. Additional training for all IT staff. Training is big for me. I wanna make sure that our team is on the cutting edge, especially with all the virtual threats that come through. And I, I, we want to make sure we have, we, we have a better, a more robust training budget for the next two fiscal years. Um, if there's somewhere where I would ever ask for additional spending, that would probably be it because I think a trained staff is a happy staff and a trained staff is also an efficient staff. Uh, we want to make sure we're cutting, cutting edge and responding to cyber threats and to help IT members be better educators, not only for our SEO users, but for, all, for anybody who uses the Advantage system uh, statewide. 
fiscal operations. Uh, this has also been called agency services in the past, but it's a little bit more encompassing than that. So we are going to be, we are rolling it out, calling it fiscal operations at this point in time. It's the largest of our four SCO teams with 19 team members. This team will be heavily involved with Smart 21 SAP. Their functions include agency services, including check printing, which we also not only do check printing for the state's payroll and that, but we also uh, do welfare payments, settlement checks, checks for unclaimed property, bank wires, garnishments, processing and decentralized journal vouchers. For those of you that don't know what a, D, what a JVD is, that is, uh, those are the vouchers that are basically moving monies between agencies. We have to input those manually on a daily basis. Accounting and System Administration Advantage Help Desk. External services, taking phone calls, may, um, responding to public payment inquiries and public information requests. Uh, internal services, accounts payable, budgets, payroll, HR tests. IRS reporting requirements for the 1099s, Form 941, 941, a little bit of background on that. That is our, that is our basically our tax reporting form where we report the, we, we um, send in the federal taxes on a quarterly basis. Uh, we also respond to bank levies. Single audit and federal reporting, this is the major report that comes out of the fiscal operations team. Um, we do bank, bank, bank reconciliations and prior year audit findings. The schedule of expenditures of federal awards, also known as the CIFA. The Treasury State Agreement, TSA, which is used for determining interest calculations. On an annual basis, we have to bring an uh, interest calculation um, estimate to uh, Board of Examiners, and, and that comes up in March. And the Cash Management, Improve Cash Management Improvement Act, CMIA annual report. And our vendor, serv vendor services desk, creating and maintaining vendor records for the state. We are in the process of working with the treasurer's office and implementing what's called payment works, which is going to be a much more secure method for verifying bank account information, um, co corporate information and that. That has, already been, that has already been paid for and we're in the process of implementing that. That will make our vendor process even more secure than it is right now and take away a lot of the manual operations there. And that, that, that concludes my presentation on the office at this point in time, but I am more than happy to answer any questions or concerns from the committee. Thank you. Any questions for the committee? Assemblywoman Taylor, then Assemblywoman Thomas. Thank you, Chair. And good morning. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate your humor. Ha. Uh, just a question. You talked a little bit about the training and, and the, the, the cyber threats that are out there. Um, has the controller's office ever been hacked um, in Nevada? Um, if, if, and now I may have a follow-up to that, Chair, if you allow. Um, Madam Chair, would you prefer that I address the assembly member directly? Please go directly Thank to you. the member. Thank, Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Assemblyman Taylor, uh, once again, James Smack, Chief Deputy Controller for the record. Um, under, the, under my watch, we haven't been hacked. So the four years that I was here prior and then the last couple of years, couple of months since I've returned, uh, we haven't had a hacking information, a hacking incident. We have had a couple of incidents through our vendor team where we've had folks try to change bank account information for different businesses and that type of thing. So far, we've been able to catch those through our manual processes, and we're hoping that the payment works solution will keep that from happening because that's going to give each individual vendor their own sign in through payment works. So they would have to actually go through the payment works process as opposed to just doing a manual DocuSign form to make changes which we have to verify through our, we have a, a report we get from the bank, from Wells Fargo, verifying bank accounts on a daily basis, but it is a manual process. The payment works process will hopefully make that a little bit more streamlined. But thankfully, we haven't had any, any kind of a significant hacking incident that I'm aware of. Okay, thank you. Ch Chair, may, may I follow up? Yes, go ahead, Assemblyman. Um, thank you very much. Um, very, very good. Just so you mentioned the, the payment work system, the new system, is that really the system? Is, is that what we have in place to guard against that? Or are there other things that, that um, you think will keep, keep the office safe? Thank you again for that, for that question, Assemblywoman. Uh, again, James Smack, Chief Deputy Controller for the record. Um, Payment Works is just a small piece for security. That is a piece that basically is security for our vendors that are doing business with the state. That, that is something that we strictly use for our vendor, our vendor desk, which is our, our, our singular operation that we have down in Las Vegas. We have three team members down there in a small office in the Grand Sawyer. And payment works is more for the, more for 
streamlining security for our vendors. So somebody can't go in and say, I'm vendor ABC, I want to change the bank account to this and then get take a take a payment, take a payment from the state and then the state ends up paying somebody who's a fraudulent entity. Mm -hmm. uh, payment Works provides a provides their solution. They provide guarantees behind their solution that they indemnify the state up to two million dollars for any kind of fraudulent activity as well. So it's a it's a great program. I'm just learning a little bit more about it myself, but we are in the process. This is going to be a quick implementation. I believe that the time frame is just eight weeks, so we're hopefully to have that up and running by the end of April. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Assemblyman Thomas. Good morning, and thank you, Chair, and thank you for the presentation. Um, I just have a quick question. When you were um, speaking about your debt collection. You had made, made mention, I think I heard you said that you have 14 employees, or was that a, a slip there that you kind of want 10 more? Thank you, th Assembly Woman, thank you for that question again, James Smack, Chief Deputy Controller. We have four total employees for our debt collection system. We do have in, we do have in our budget, this wasn't a money committee, so I hadn't really gone into that, but we do have a um, request through the government. Uh, we do have in the gov recommended budget an additional position for that for that team but that would only bring us to five i wasn't I, I wasn't trying to infer that we're trying to get 10 more positions for that for that section uh to be honest with you i'd like to earn that meaning that if we're going to add one more position i'd like us to hit our goals and prove that that position is actually paying for itself before we would come to this to well not necessarily this committee but to the to the body in general in order to um, <clears throat> request additional positions because we can prove that this one position paid for itself, taking our goal from the $1.2 million present day up to $2 million, I, I think would, would, would demonstrate that level of accomplishment. So that's what we're looking to accomplish with that. Thank you, sir, for making the record clear. I appreciate it. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you. I think it's no surprise to us that this office likes to be uh, have the control over the matters going before itself. Uh, Assemblyman Wynn. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to kind of ha um, ask if you um, have, uh, either the, the controller can answer this or the, the dep uh, chief deputy can, in terms of your strategy, because I looked at your duties of the office, right, and a lot of Nevadans, especially even folks in my district, are not familiar with what, what the controller do. Uh, but in terms of um, looking for waste and, and efficiency, um, has there been an assigned person, I don't know if that's you, Chief Deputy, or other folks in the controller's office that is charged with modernizations? Because the reason I'm asking that question is that sometime as a customer of the controller's office um, in my previous roles, uh, there are processes that are still a little bit um, cumbersome, for example. And maybe that's just because how we've been doing things for the last, I don't know, 100 years. But in terms of what um, the office is intending to do and maybe under the leadership of the new controller that if there's a designated person or there's a plan somewhere in the office in terms of looking at how to modernize how you do business with the controller's office. Assemblyman Wynn, thank you for that question. Uh, again, James Smack, Chief Deputy Controller, for the record. Um, modernization is always something that we're looking to do within the office. Payment works being one of those solutions in a, in a, in a small role. Um, much of the cumbersome processes that you've gone through have to do with the fact that we're operating on an accounting system that is close to 25 years old at this point in time. The Advantage accounting system was implemented in 1999. So we're operating on technology that is programmed in COBOL. It is, it is difficult to make changes. I'm not saying it's impossible to make changes, but it is difficult to make changes. We have two COBOL programmers in our office. I do everything I can to keep them very happy so we don't need to go find another COBOL programmer at any point in time. So, um, and they, and, and they, do, they, do an, they do an amazing job keeping the system up to date, modern, making sure that, it's, that, it's, um, that, that, it, that it is responsive to making sure we don't have any problems with cyber threats and that our IT team does an amazing job as far as that goes they they are, they are on the cutting edge they take the training that they can get most of it being virtually delivered but they try to but we do have um we do have one officer that is specifically des one team member that's specifically designated for handling anything that comes through as far as cyber threats or cyber concerns or that type of thing he keeps our office informed of, of potential issues and keeps our team informed 
to make sure that we are we are staying on top of these things and staying on top of new threats that might come through. The fact is, though, we're working with 25-year-old technology, and so some of the cumbersome things that you've had to go through in the past, Assemblyman, and I apologize for that in, in, in advance, but we will continue to try and modernize our solutions, and we are very hopeful that with the replacement for Advantage coming with the SAP project, that that will help us modernize a whole bunch of things in our office and a bunch of our processes to make it easier for everybody in the state to work with us. I appreciate the answer. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Are there any other questions from the committee, or did he have good control over the presentation? It seems you did. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, at this time, we will now open the hearing on AB3. AB3 revises provisions governing financial reports of the state permanent school fund. When you're ready. Thank you, Chair. Andy Matthews, Nevada State Controller. And uh, we will be pretty brief uh, regarding Assembly Bill 3. I know you like to keep good control of uh, the timelines for your committees, no doubt. So. Um, Pleasure to be able to present on Assembly Bill 3. Uh, this is a bill that is submitted by the Nevada State Controller's Office, um, and it does regard changing the reporting requirements for the Permanent School Fund. And I am once again going to turn things over to Chief Deputy Smack to walk through the details of that bill. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Controller. Um, Madam Chair, members of the committee, for the record, again, James Smack, Chief Deputy Controller, uh, Office of the Nevada Controller. Um, I'm here to offer testimony on Assembly Bill 3, the bill submitted by the State Controller's Office, actually submitted by our, by our predecessor, in regard to changing reporting requirements for the Permanent School Fund. Let me give you a little background on the Permanent School Fund. It was established by the Nevada Legislature in the late 1800s in Article 11, Section 3 of the Nevada Constitution. The State Permanent School Fund monies are pledged for educational purposes only. They cannot be used or transferred for any other use. They are constitutionally protected funds. These monies come from fines collected by the counties under the penal laws of Nevada. Also, any monies bequeathed to the state and the state monies is cheated to the state would be other sources of funding. Interest earnings from the school fund are placed in the state distributive school account and appropriated among the Nevada school districts and charter schools. The most recent report dated February 6, 2023 is available at controller.nv.gov, which is a report that ends in, on June 30, 2022, coinciding with the end of fiscal year 22. The principal balance of the fund is $473,985,036 at the end of the fiscal year. We've been reporting on this fund quarterly through the State Controller's Office in coordination with the Treasurer's Office. It is the only public report issued by our office that is compiled and released on a quarterly basis. We have found this process takes a great deal of time for at least one of our accountants um, on our financial reporting team to compile the information, work back and forth with the treasurer's office to get additional information, and then compile and release an unaudited report each quarter. This preparation process takes 60 hours or more per quarter, depending on how much back and forth we have with the treasurer's office and, and, and how and to get the report completed. This review, the review time for the office um, for this report can take up to eight hours or more on top of that. And the 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 the, the reason being is we're trying to make our office make our office a little bit more efficient and by doing this we do all of our other reporting annually and the ACFR at this point in time has gone from what used to be more of a six-month process to more of a nine-month process and we'd like to be able to turn some of that time to the preparation of the ACFR to make sure that we are doing that more efficiently and trying to get ourselves back down to where the ACFR is uh, that I mean the ACFR is the report for the previous fiscal year We'd like to make sure that's out on the street at, at, at a point in time where it's actually timely, uh, when we don't, when the AFRA doesn't get produced until April, May, June, or something like that of the following fiscal year. You're looking at a report that's a, that's giving you year-old information at that point in time, and we really want to try to find a way to streamline all of our processes in order to concentrate on making sure we have the AFRA out in a timely manner. Uh, by changing this to annual reporting, the 240 plus hours needed to compile the information would be reduced down to 60 hours per annum because we can report, we can produce the annual report as quickly as we can produce a quarterly report. This would save at least 200 hours per year or five weeks of an ACFR accountant's time that can be focused on that completion of the ACFR. Um, the controller's office feels that annual reporting will be sufficient for the public interest as the ACFR path for single audit reporting, rainy day fund transfer and reporting, and all other reporting from our office is presently done on an annual basis. 
And with that, I'm going to wrap up my presentation on this. I, I, I told Andy I'd keep it under 45 minutes, so I did. And thank you for this opportunity to briefly present on Assembly Bill 3, and I'd be happy to entertain any questions or concerns at this point. Members, any questions? Yeah. Assemblyman Thomas. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the presentation. Just one quick question. You know, um, you were doing um, reports quarterly. Um, why did you, um, your office, decide to do yearly when you could actually have a um, biannual? Thank you for that question, Madam, uh, excuse me. Thank you for that question, Assemblywoman. Uh, again, for the record, James Smack, Chief Deputy Controller. Um, we were streamlining it with our processes of every other report that we do that comes from our office being an annual report. Um, obviously, semi-annually would still be a easier process for our office than, an, than, than quarterly, um, but we, we chose annual just to streamline that as much as anything with all the other reporting that our office does. We would still be able to produce that. We would still be able to produce that with a much uh, smaller time commitment from our accounting team allowing those accountants to, allowing the accountant that does prepare this report to spend more time on the production of the ACFR and less time on producing a, a, a quarterly report. So that was, the, that was the thinking of the previous controller and the previous chief deputy when they, came, when they uh, came to the conclusion to submit this bill to change the reporting requirement from quarterly to annually. And it is also the thinking of uh, Controller Matthews and myself that it would be helpful to have those 200 or so hours back for the preparation of the ACFR. Thank you. Assemblyman De Silva and then Vice Chair Duran. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mrs. Smack, uh, just a quick question. So have you uh, had any conversations with maybe the, uh, the State Department of Education and see how they feel about the, uh, the annual reporting as opposed to the quarterly reporting? Thank you for that question, Assemblyman. Again, James Smack, Chief Deputy Controller for the record. Uh, have I had direct conversations with the Department of Education? No, I have not. I would have to defer it back to my predecessor to see whether those conversations took place. I know we had conversations with the Treasurer's Office, and the Treasurer's Office, while they're not, uh, they're, they, they are, not, are not in disagreement with us that this can be moved to an annual report. Uh, thank you, thank you, sir. Yeah, if you do have any uh, sort of a communication, or you can uh, bring us some feedback about that communication, we'd be uh, with this committee would uh, would love to hear from you. Thank That's you. That's something I will be happy to uh, reach out to a couple contacts I have in the Department of Education and get their feedback. Thank you, Assemblyman, and I think um, we as a committee can reach out as well. So I'll um, I'll ask if the staff could help um, just kind of see if the NDE has any feedback on that, um, and then we can get a letter of some sort um, and post to add it to the bill before we work session. Um, the document or if you're able to have quicker contact feel free to reach out as well um, and vice chair Duran thank you and thank you for the presentation um, I think you might have answered my question so uh, would this impact uh, by you submitting a yearly uh, report again will it have any effect for this the state treasurer as well as the LCB in their reporting because is that going to because I know they do a report also is this going to be a are they going to move to a yearly report as well for that I know we have some reporting that they do do and I'm not sure if it's going to be moved as well or do we know that question or answer Good morning, Assemblywoman, and thank you for that question again, James Smack, Chief Deputy Controller. For the record, I believe somebody is here from the Treasurer's Office that can address that a little bit more completely. Um, I believe this would save them um, reporting time, too, because they would only be getting this information to us on an annual basis versus, ha versus having to compile it quarterly. But I don't want to speak out of turn for the Treasurer's Office themselves. I believe the Treasurer's Office has one of their deputies here who will be, making, who will be providing testimony on that, on that fact going forward. And for the first time this session, thanks to Vice Chair Duran, uh, our legal, Asher Killian. Thank you, Madam Chair. Asher Killian, Committee Counsel. Um, so this reporting is additionally submitted to the State Treasurer and the Fiscal Analysis, Analysis Division of the LCB. Um, I can check with our fiscal staff to see how this would impact their reporting. I don't know offhand, but we can get that information to the committee. Thank you. 
looks like our committee came ready to take control of the situation. Are there any additional questions? Seeing none, um, thank you for your presentation. Um, at this time, we'll go ahead and open it up to testimony in support of AB3. If there's anybody uh, here in Carson City, anybody in Las Vegas, Broadcasts, is there anyone on the line? Chair, the public line is open and working, but there are no callers for support at this time. Thank you. Is there anyone opposi in opposition here in, Los in Carson City? And in Las Vegas? BPS, is there anyone on the line for opposition? <laughs> Chair, the public line is open and working, but there are no callers in opposition. And testimony in neutral. Is there anybody coming wishing to testify in neutral here in Carson City? It appears there is. Good morning. For the record, my name is Jeff Landerfeld, Deputy Treasurer, Debt Management. Madam Chair, on behalf of the State Treasurer's Office, I would like to I would like the record to reflect that the Treasurer's Office is neutral on this bill. Um, while we do use permanent school fund uh, financial information when proposing permanent school fund guarantees to the Board of Finance and also for um, disclosure compliance, uh, annual data will work just fine for our purposes. Uh, so changing the financial report requirement to annual um, will not impact our use of the information. Uh, thank you and I'll be glad to answer any questions. Thank you, members. Any additional questions for the treasurer's office? No, I think that actually answered the question, though, that we had earlier. So thank you. I appreciate it. Is there anyone else wishing to testify neutral here in Las Vegas? Or in Carson City? Sorry, anywhere you are, I just wish you to testify. <laughs> BVS, is there anyone wishing to testify in neutral on the line? Chair, the public line is open and working, but there are no callers for neutral at this time. All right, thank you. Uh, any closing remarks? Uh, Madam Chair, as I get ready to head back to my office and make sure that everything is under control there, I just uh, thank you and all of the committee members for your time this morning. Good to see you all. Take care. Thank you, Controller Matthews. It's always good to see you. I hope your office is under control, um, uh, and if not, that you could get that situation under control as quickly as possible. Um, thank you. At this time, we will go ahead and move on to a presentation of the Department of Veterans Services with the Director, Fred Wagger. Good morning, Madam Chair. If I can begin. Yes, please begin. And just remember to state your names for the record. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I appreciate it, uh, and members of the committee as well, for the opportunity to present an overview of Nevada Department of Veterans Services. My name is Fred Wagger, and I serve as the department's director. Uh, today with me uh, here in Carson City is the uh, Executive Officer, Chief Financial Officer of NDVS, uh, Joe Thiele. And in the south, I have uh, Deputy Directors Evan Rush and Vivian Ruiz and IT Manager uh, as well, uh, Brandon Torres. And uh, they're just here to support us in case there's any questions that I can't answer. Uh, I want to go to uh, our briefing. Uh, the down arrow. There we go. So I just want to briefly say what our vision is. And so our vision is to ensure that all Nevada veterans, military, and their dependents are aware of and understand what their benefits are and connect them to those benefits uh, whenever we can. Uh, you'll see as well the mission and the seven lines of uh, major lines of effort to accomplish that mission. And you can read that uh, at your leisure. Uh, because uh, I don't need to read all those to you, I'm sure. 
Uh, I want to talk about our demographics a little bit. As you can see on this slide, nearly 70% of our veterans are in the south, particularly in Clark County. Uh, however, it is NDVS's responsibility to ensure that we reach out to all veterans throughout the state. As our World War II, Korea, and, and Vietnam veterans age, it's more important than ever to ensure that we are providing them with resources they need. The Gulf War veterans, like myself, are now the largest population of veterans in the state. With the uh, changes uh, to federal regulations, in particular with the uh, Department of Veterans Affairs uh, now having the PACT Act uh, approved, uh, there's more claims than ever. So it's uh, very challenging, but uh, a great challenge for us to ensure all of our veterans have received uh, the benefits they've earned. Uh, we have numerous programs that have started since we began. So in 1943, NDBS started uh, with the uh, um, just one person, uh, just the director, who also did claims for veterans. Uh, this last year, 2022, we started two programs. The first one is the Crombie Academy, which is at the Southern Nevada State Veterans Home, where we educate individuals to become certified nursing assistants and provide them training all the way through certification. Uh, this is increases the number of CNAs here in the state. The second is the Youth Serving uh, Veterans Recognition Program. Uh, some of you may be familiar with our Veteran of the Month, Veteran Supporter of the Month through the Veterans Service Commission. Uh, this is an additional recognition now for the youth uh, here in the state who are serving our, our veterans. Uh, just briefly uh, look at our organizational chart and the staff who are serving our veterans. Uh, as you know, we, as you can see by this slide on the right-hand side, you have the Veterans Service Commission. The Veterans Service Commission, while not paid employees, are part of our organizational chart is there's a small amount of uh, travel budget in our general account. And then, then we also have advisory committees at the Southern Cemetery, Northern Cemetery, and the Women Veterans uh, Committees. Uh, Women Veterans Advisory Committee, I'm sorry. Uh, you can see here with the benefits division, it's overseen by Deputy Director Evan Rush, administrative support from the Executive Officer Joe Thiele, and health care services by the Deputy Director Vivian Ruiz. Our total FTE currently is 251.49. Uh, we are requesting eight positions. Uh, we'll discuss those in just a bit, and that would increase our total FTE for the department to 259.49. Discuss our homes a little bit. We're very proud of our homes. The Southern Nevada State Veterans Home is a 24-hour, 180-bed skilled nursing facility for veterans, spouses, and Gold Star parents. This five-star rated home uh, opened in 2002 and just celebrated its 20th anniversary last year. It has also been named by U.S. News and World Report uh, 2223 as best nursing home. Our northern skilled uh, facility is the Northern Nevada State Veterans Home, a 96 bed, 24 uh, hour skilled nursing facility, again for veterans, spouses, and Gold Star parents. Uh, it it enab enables uh, the residents proudly uh, share their common identity. That's the difference about a veteran's home. Uh, we uh, received a five-star rating in the first year that this home uh, received eligibility. They received a five-star rating, so we're very proud of that. That's through the CMS or the Medicare Medicaid program. Uh, our cemeteries, briefly, uh, include the Northern Nevada Veterans Memorial Cemetery, which is in Fernley. Uh, since its opening, we've interred 13,012 veterans through the end of January. Uh, that's veterans and spouses interred. We have not interred any Gold Star parents, even though they're eligible. Uh, we've had uh, approximately 59% uh, of our interments are cremations and 41% are casket. Uh, we recently completed an expansion of both casket and cremation sites at this cemetery. That was completed uh, December of 22. 
The Southern, uh, Southern Nevada Veterans Memorial Cemetery uh, is in Boulder City. Uh, that is the second busiest state veterans cemetery in the nation. Uh, it's an extremely busy cemetery. Proud of our staff at both cemeteries. Since its opening, it's interred 51,380 interments. Overall, since the cemetery began, uh, cremations have tended to go upward uh, from 28% when it first started to this last uh, period of time at 66% are cremations. Uh, we uh, completed, as I mentioned, the expansion into the Northern Cemetery in 22. The North Southern Nevada Veterans Memorial Cemetery just started an expansion on February 6th of 2023, so just this month. Uh, the northern one was a combination of both cremains and burials. The southern one is all cremains in ground and columbarium walls. Um, we have no charge to inter veterans at the cemetery. Uh, we do charge a small fee of $450 for spouses and Gold Star parents. I'd like to talk about our veteran advocacy and support team. That's our veteran service officers and our NVA programs. So we assist veterans, service members, and family members uh, to access benefits and opportunities. We have vast offices in Las Vegas, Boulder City, Pahrump, here up in Reno, Fallon, Elko, and Winnemucca. We have one program manager that runs that entire, opera entire operations, two administrative assistants in Reno and Las Vegas, and 17 veteran service officers throughout the state. Our VSOs conduct on average 15 face-to-face -face interviews a week and 100 telephone, 100 telephone contacts per week and have an average active workload of 400 cases each. Each VSO annually generates nearly $16 million on annual benefits brought in to the state for our veterans. The VAST Director also manages our Nevada Veteran Advocacy Pro Program, providing federal and state resources and information to be shared with service members and veterans and dependents by these volunteers. Currently, we have 924 individuals who have completed the advocacy course. Our community outreach programs, uh, as you can see, we have a number of those and what they do in supporting the veteran community councils and uh, outreach events, uh, virtual outreach to communities uh, and, to our, and for our veteran service organization during the pandemic. Uh, we helped a couple of organizations actually hold their annual meetings uh, in virtually. And so uh, we have a great relationship with all of our veteran service organizations here in the state. Our Nevada Transition Assistance Program ensures that service members, veterans of all areas, eras, and their families are prepared to next step in civilian life. This is especially important for those transitioning out of the military. The Nevada Women Veterans Program addresses the unique veterans population in this area with specific benefits, services, and programs for those women veterans. Our LGBTQ Veterans Program welcomes and honors the service of these veterans, providing information and resources previously not well known. Uh, by doing this, uh, we, in, in, do, in order to do this, uh, we do a number of outreach events for them. We'll talk about our revenue a little bit. Uh, the funds to operate our programs comes from many sources. Uh, the primary revenue source is direct funds received from operations at our veterans' home, as shown in blue, and the uh, cemeteries in the purple areas. Uh, this also includes funds from VA, Medicare, Medicaid. Only 6% of our budget comes from general funds. I want to talk about some major enhancements and priorities that we have uh, for this year. The first one is the remodel of our, our Southern Nevada State Veterans Home. This is an 84,692 square foot, 180 bed, 96 room 
Veterans Skilled Nursing Home located in Boulder City. This is a continuation of uh, uh, CIP Project 21-P03, and this is to remodel it so that it's a single occupancy room instead of double occupancy. Uh, it's very important, uh, and we discovered that during the pandemic, how that works. Our one in Sparks is a single bed, 96 bed facility, and uh, uh, we had a lot less problems with uh, people passing COVID back and forth. So uh, we're very proud of this project and we're hoping that this gets approved, uh, excuse me, approved this year. Uh, planning for the uh, construction of the Nevada Veterans Home, um, I, sh I should say on uh, slide 13, I actually had a schematic of the, uh, the home as we see it. The white areas you can see are the existing building, the brown areas are uh, additional construction that's gonna need to be completed. This actually adds another wing. So we have three wings, 180 beds, 96 rooms. We're going to increase that to 120 rooms, 120 beds. That does reduce the number of beds, but I'll get that in the next enhancement. Uh, very, uh, very happy about this. This will be single room facility. It's gonna be a very nice structure when it gets done. Um, unfortunately, right now, with 90% of our rooms being double occupancy, those rooms also sh share a toilet with the other double occupancy. So you got four, four veterans trying to share one bathroom in their wheelchairs, and it's just not accessible. Uh, it's, it's not done in a way that's uh, rewarding to our veterans. And so single occupancy is gonna be very, very helpful. And that moves me to the next enhancement, which is the North Las Vegas State Veterans Home Advanced Planning Project 23151. So this project will provide advanced planning through construction documents for a 128 bed, single occupancy, skilled nursing facility on the Veterans Affairs campus in North Las Vegas on land to be donated by the state or to the state by VA, VA Sierra Nevada Healthcare System. Upon transfer, this would be solely state owned property. The campus seeks to create a, re, a re, residential atmosphere. Uh, this project will include facilities for administrative offices, receiving and storage, nursing offices, and other sports services. Now the funds for this advanced planning project are 100% state funds. I wanna be clear on that. The federal grant program for this project will then reimburse the state for 65% of all qualifying costs uh, upon once the grant, grant is awarded. Um, in order to have the VA consider this project, the state has to uh, show that they're willing to put up the funds and get reimbursed for two thirds of those costs. We can't say when it'll be awarded, but the uh, VA has always awarded those grants at some point. They don't back away from that. They, they help us out much and we've had a, a great relationship and they've funded so many uh, expansions. They're actually the ones who helped us build the Southern home and the Northern home. Uh, so at some point we're gonna get the money from the VA and uh, if you have any questions about that, we can uh, discuss that later. I do want to talk about some uh, enhancements we're requesting as far as uh, personnel. And so we are requesting two veteran service officers, one to be co located at the Northern uh, Nevada State Veterans Home in Sparks. It's per our contract. Right now we have a part-time uh, employee that goes back and forth between the Reno uh, corporate office and the uh, home. And it's just not as productive as it could be. And so we are asking that uh, 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 through the governor that these uh, be allowed. The other person uh, we're looking at putting in Carson City, we have a part-time contract employee there now, and this would put a full-time state employee um, as that contract person is leaving us. We have a request for two grounds maintenance workers at the Southern Cemetery. Uh, as I mentioned, this is the second busiest state cemetery in the nation. Uh, the expansion project was started on February 6th, I'm sorry, 
yeah, February 6th, uh, to add four more acres and 10,000 more uh, in-ground and columbary walls uh, located and requiring additional personnel. The uh, next one is Suicide Prevention Program Manager, currently a contract position. We'd like to make that a state position. Uh, this was established in 2018 to co-lead the governor's challenge to reduce uh, suicide and uh, among our active duty and veterans. Uh, the person also acts as the liaison for NDVS to the mayor's challenges in Elko, Winnemucca, Truckee Meadows here in Reno and Sparks, and Las Vegas. Our next person is the healthcare champion program manager that's been present since 2020. This is again a contract employee. Uh, the 2020 is when the statute required NDVS to educate medical professionals uh, regarding military service and the military culture's impact on the aging process of veterans. It also oversees the veteran in care program which is where we go out and recognize veterans within uh, assisted living pro, uh, and nursing homes with, uh, uh, throughout the state uh, in a formal uh, ceremony that uh, really recognizes them. Uh, the next one is the Education and Employment Program Manager. This person's been in place, or this position's been in place since 2014. Uh, to locate all education and employment resources within the state to share with our, our Nevadans, uh, uh, Nevada veterans. This person's also in charge of our recently established Nevada S uh, Transition Assistance Program. The Federal Transition Assistance Program does not talk about state benefits, so we created our own, and we've done uh, one in Las Vegas near Nellis Air Force Base, and just last weekend we did another one in Fallon near Naval Air Station, and we plan on continuing those uh, to make sure our transitioning service members especially, but veterans are also invited along with their spouses. And the last one we have is the Northern Nevada Outreach uh, Director. This position was created in 2017. This is again a contract employee. Uh, prior to having this contract employee, we had one outreach director and that person was in Las Vegas. That person could not cover the whole state. So we brought on a contract employee and our outreach has nearly doubled since we brought that person on. Um, so the addition of this contract uh, employee or a state employee would be extremely helpful to our veterans. The next one is the chapel remodel at the Southern Nevada uh, Veterans Memorial Cemetery, Project 7619. This is used for interment services for Nevada veterans and their dependents. And for the last years, we've started receiving comments from the public uh, about the appearance of the building. Uh, this project will design and construct the remodel of both interior and exterior uh, at the chapel, uh, of the chapel at the cemetery. It's the most visited building at the cemetery uh, as all visitors uh, attending interment services uh, use this, this facility. Uh, we also have several large special events, especially Memorial Day uh, in May and Wreaths Cross America in December, uh, where we have large crowds uh, and they use this as well. During the building's over 17 years of operation, it's never been repainted. The exterior paint is flaking and the interior paint is stained and the ceiling is currently leaking causing safety hazard for both staff and visitors. My superintendent and uh, ground supervisors have gone on the roof numerous times to repair the roof uh, and you can only partially patch that so uh, over and over they have uh, leaking roof problems. And finally I want to talk about the uh, Northern Nevada Veterans Memorial Cemetery uh, committal building construction uh, CIP project 7643. The only facility currently available for groups attending interments for veterans and attending ceremonies is an open air committal shelter which is subject to the weather for attendees as you can imagine interments right now where they're outside in this shelter uh, that has three sides and a roof is not exactly conducive especially to our elderly veterans 
and so we've asked for this project to design and construct a committal building uh, at the cemetery. The building will include restrooms, storage, and an adjacent parking lot. The, this is totally needed to provide a fully enclosed, larger alternative location for memorial or interment services uh, closer to the recently finished cemetery expansion that I mentioned earlier. Chair Torres, uh, Vice Chair Duran, and members of the Assembly Committee on Veteran Affairs, I want to thank you for the opportunity to present uh, an overview of NDVS. This concludes my overview of presentation. I do have presentations for AB 36 and 44 to present when you are ready, but I stand for questions. Thank you. At this time, I will go ahead and open it up to the members who have general questions. Um, but before we do that, I do want to just uh, once again, thank you for all the work that you do with our veterans in our community. And thank you as well for your service to this country. I know in this committee, we actually have a number of veterans. Um, and I believe uh, that that includes Assemblyman De Silva, Assemblywoman Thomas, um, and of course, you know, our uh, most senior veteran in the group, Assemblyman Richard MacArthur, who was actually, I believe it was a second lieutenant um a, a pilot in vietnam so thank you so much all for your service we really appreciate it and i love hearing um all, all the stories and what we can do too to better improve services for veterans in our community um, i see assemblyman Gurr has a question anybody else okay uh, i got a couple questions I'll, I'll take them all thank you assemblyman Gurr to begin thank you madam chair uh thank you for the presentation very informative i'm from elko and Mr. Hernandez, Gil Hernandez, I suppose you're aware of him. He's been actively working to serve the veterans in the northern part of the state, northeastern corner. The last time I talked to Gil, we were talking about a, a cemetery. Is that still in process? Because I didn't see it on here. Uh, Director Weiger, for the record, uh, through the chair, can I go directly to the assemblyman? Yes, please do. Okay. Uh, assemblyman, great question. Thank you for that. Uh, yes, we are uh, aware of the cemetery that's going to be uh, put in there. Uh, I have talked to the National Cemetery Administration because this is going to be considered a national cemetery, so it won't fall directly under us. But I know that if veterans have questions, we're going to get the questions, and so we'll pass those on. But yeah, they are looking at uh, construction uh, possibly as early as uh, later this year. Uh, it's, it appears that they will be open and accepting interments uh, in 25. Great, thank you. Follow up, Madam Chair. Go ahead. Also, I appreciate what you're doing for them up there. Uh, what about the health care services that they were working so hard on? Did they get a clinic up there? Uh, Director Weiger, for the record, uh, Assemblyman, thank you for the question. Um, uh, unfortunately, that's the VA and we're oh. NDVS, so that's federal and we're state. Okay. But we try to track that well. Uh, last time I heard it was opening, so I am not sure. I found uh, last time I heard Coy Miller from uh, uh, Salt Lake City, because Salt Lake City takes care of that clinic. Uh, he had said they found a doctor, and so I'm not sure if that's still the case or not. It's hard to find people to go to rural locations and, and work out there, but yes, uh, we keep hoping, and we are on a call every month with uh, Salt Lake City and Gill and, and the community up there, the veterans community, uh, and we'll continue to track that. But that is a, a federal uh, VA clinic. Thank you. I appreciate it. I didn't understand the difference. Problem. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Assembly and Taylor. Thank you, Chair, and thank you so much for the presentation. Very informative, and I'm going to just concur with my, my colleague, Assemblyman Gurr. I, I, I had a question regarding hospitalization as well, um, just to make sure I did understand the, the clarification, and it's certainly aligned, because I don't know if you're aware, there's a, um, they're moving the VA hospital in Reno. The announcement just came out to a new location, so my thinking on the way in is, yay, great, new hospital. So um, just wanted to share. I don't, I don't want to waste my question on that, though, Chair, so just, that was a comment. Okay, okay. <laughs> Just wanted to say we're paying attention. But, but I do have this question. Um, on your enhancements number five, thank you for referring to those, uh, uh, the, the, the locations of interment services. I've been to several of those um, in Fernley. And oh my, it gets a little chilly, cool. I've been out there in the rain, snow, and all of that. And so thank you for that being on the list. And my question, though, is in Southern Nevada, I know this, there's a chapel, but, there's a, but in Northern Nevada, you refer to it as an interment facility. Can you, I mean, a f facility to have those, can you help me understand the difference? Uh, 
Director Weiger, for the record, thank you for the question, ma'am. Uh, basically, a chapel and a committal, kid, excuse me, a committal uh, building is the same. Okay. It's it's just some place where you can have the interments. Right. The chapel down south is, of course, m much larger what, than what we're looking at. Mm -hmm. This, I believe, a two thousand about a two thousand square foot facility, but it's going to have bathrooms and everything. And right now, if you've said you've been out there. It's, uh, it's quite a chore, so uh, I appreciate your support by going out there, but uh, uh, the buildings are basically the same, and uh, this would be very helpful in the north with some enclosed place to have those interment ceremonies. Yes, it, it certainly will. It gets a little cool out there, so th thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Assemblyman De Silva. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, Director Wagner, for a uh, all of your dedicated service uh, to our uh, veterans in this state. You know, you are a, a go-to person for so many of us for information, for updates, and for, uh, you know, uh, the, the needs of our community. So thank you for your service to our state and to our country. I have uh, two, uh, two questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, if, uh, I was wondering if you could a uh, extrapolate on uh, the uh, department's relationship to the, uh, the VSOs, uh, the, the VFW, the American Legion, uh, the other uh, uh, non-governmental uh, uh, organizations that are also uh, helping us in this in this endeavor of pursuing benefits, you know, largely, and uh, just uh, let, let the uh, audience at large know about uh, that relationship. And then, secondly, too, uh, you know, this is again from a perspective of, of a research. Lately, I've been doing some research on uh, on veterans-related bills that I've been working on, and I and I saw it here in, in this presentation too, and that's the uh, the, the Gulf War One and Two uh, designation. I know amongst amongst the veteran community, amongst those of us who pay attention, we know the difference. Uh, but oftentimes, uh, you know, uh, I think there needs to be more of a, uh, a differentiation there between the Persian Gulf uh, conflict and in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, especially when it comes to uh, some of us in, in, in the uh, legislative process here who are looking at the needs of those specific communities. Uh, the Persian Gulf conflict was l largely uh, baby boomers and uh, Generation X who uh, served in, uh, and, and fought in that war. But we have major contributions made uh, in, in uh, the Iraq and Afghanistan war by millennials and Generation Z. And we have different needs. And uh, sometimes I'm seeing this, especially when it comes to things like fiscal notes, uh, that the research is, uh, is, 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 is actually uh, putting both of them together. And uh, we have a little bit of a skewed number. So as, uh, you know, just from a, 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 re a research perspective, a data collection and analysis perspective, if we could differentiate the two in some of the, uh, the, the information and data that's going out from the Department of uh, Veteran Services, because it is having, I, I can see a, uh, an effect on some of our research and the folks that, we, that are doing the research uh, for us. So again, those are just my two. Uh, one is a comment, the other one is more of a question. Thank you, thank you, Director, and thank you, Madam Chair. Director Weiger, for the record, thank you for the uh, question, I appreciate it. Uh, we do reach out to all, in fact, it, we have a, a program that says we will recognize all veterans of all eras, and we do that. If you ever come down to the memorial, uh, in front of the Grant Sawyer building, you will see the statues out there, and you have the Gulf War statue. Happens to be Air Force, I'm Army, so. Uh, but the, uh, uh, the Gulf War, uh, the GWAT statues are actually uh, three, uh, four uh, individuals uh, in that statue. Uh, and I think it's a beautiful statue that recognizes GWAT separately from Persian Gulf. I happen to be Persian Gulf, but uh, uh, we try to recognize GWAT, and we've talked about what we can do publicly other than uh, recognizing them on our social media and our newsletter, those kind of things. But we have, uh, have done that. Um, I'm trying to remember what the question was. Oh, yeah. relationships. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Director Weiger, for the record. Um, my XO reminded me, so he's better. But uh, the relationships are, are wonderful. I, I tell you, I, and I'm a life member of, of VFW American Legion, DAV, uh, but uh, uh, we have a great relationship with them and, and we try to work together. So one of the things I tell folks when I'm out speaking is, for instance, for our VSOs, uh, I don't care if they use mine, I like them to, but I don't care if they use my VSOs or one of the organizations like DAV, American Legion, VFW, who have accredited veteran service officers. And that's my, my spiel is go to accredited. There's too many people out there going, oh, I'll help, and then they get charged money. By law, American Legion, VFW, DAV, Paralyzed Veterans of America, all of those cannot charge 
that's in statu that's in federal law. And so these other ones came out now and they can they start charging. They unfortunately charge up front and it should be a portion of a percentage of any retroactive pay. And that's that's really unfortunate. So uh, we have a great uh, uh, great relationship with them and as you're gonna see in one of the bills we're gonna discuss in a little bit, uh, some training that we provide already uh, and that we wanna make sure is codified so we continue to do that in the future. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Assemblyman Taylor. I, I apologize, Assemblyman Thomas. And good morning, and thank you, Director Gwager. Um, I appreciate the um, presentation. Um, actually, I do have a comment and a question, uh, and if it's okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the comment is, um, because of uh, VSOs, I wanna say that you have an elite um, bunch of people over there, um, and I must say, um, at the VA hospital in North Las Vegas, 8017, which I represent. So I just want to put that out there because um, of the service that they have provided the community and me personally. And um, I do appreciate everything that they've done for me and, and my family. Um, the, the, the question that I have, and of course it's about female veterans. And I know that sometimes we have a, a tendency to lump us all together, but we do have distinct um, differences uh, with our male counterpart. And I think you know that. And um, some of those issues um, I wanna direct to mental health, homelessness, um, just uh, you know, a, a litany of of things that our uh, female veterans go through. And I wanna know, you know, this, I, I put this to your predecessor um, before. Um, I believe that we, you know, with all the land that's in, um, that you have um, at your disposal in uh, the veteran um, uh, over a Pecos and 215, that area. Could we not have a standalone facility for uh, that would direct to um, our female uh, veterans? Um, I think it's necessary. I think that our times have shown that it's necessary with everything that I believe that um, our um, uh, females have gone through from, um, we will say, uh, rapes. Um, uh, and this was when they were active duty military service. We must, you know, um, um, uh, pull the um, uh, blanket off of these things that have happened to our service members that served, you know, dutifully and distinctly um, in, in the service, um, regardless whether it's Air Force or um, Marines or, you know, uh, we'll go through all of them. Um, and the other thing that, another part to this question is LBG, LB, L, I'm sorry. Mm, thank you so much. Uh, tongue tied there for a minute. Um, a lot of the females that are um, in this group have also experienced it. So I think that it's time for us to have a, a, a dedicated facility that, um, and I, and I know this comes with um, having um, um, uh, medical services, um, people that can, you know, counselors of, this, of the sort that can assist, but I think it's time for us to have a standalone facility where they don't feel like um, they are um, uh, dismissive of, of what they are going through. Thank you. Uh, Director Weiger to the Assemblywoman. Thank you, Assemblywoman. Thank you so much for your questions. Two important areas. Uh, you mentioned the women veterans and, and, and our VSOs. Uh, we have a woman veterans uh, service officer 
Uh, her name is Lilani, and she does a great job. In fact, she's currently putting together the Women Veterans Conference for uh, 10 March uh, in, at the Santa Fe in North Las Vegas. Um, and we are expecting a couple hundred women veterans to be present at that. We continually do outreach to our women veterans as much as possible. Uh, she does a great job and she attends a lot of different events. Uh, trying, uh, our, one of our biggest problems in the past is having women veterans say they're veterans. And so they haven't, you know, oh, I didn't see a vote, serve overseas or I didn't serve in combat. We have some of the same with male veterans, but a lot of women veterans didn't do it. It's not as prevalent in the modern era, but it's been in the past. I've talked to too many, no, I didn't serve. I said, what do you mean you didn't serve? Well, I just stayed in the States. Did you get a DD-214? Yes, I did. Then you served. You were in the military. Uh, and it's hard to get that point across. It's, it's like you served, and we need to recognize that. And we do that as much as possible. And the Women Veterans Conference really helps with that. As far as a standalone facility, that'd be nice. That'd be really nice. Uh, uh, if somebody wants to donate some land and we put in a, a request for, for funds to do something like that, uh, that, that may be a possibility in the future. Uh, the same thing with the LGBTQ community. I, uh, I, I've been out many times and talked to folks who uh, fit into that veteran category, and I know what they've gone through, and I know how uh, they were dishonorably discharged or discharged with less than honorable because of their service, and they, they found out, and I, uh, I had that happen, and I was stationed in Monterey at the language school, and I actually had a roommate for a while who says, I think that woman down the hall is gay, and if I find out, I'm gonna report her. She does her job, leave her alone. I, you know, he says, well, if you know and you're not telling, then you're part of the problem. I'm like, and I'm a sergeant and I'll deal with it. So uh, it's been an ongoing problem. Uh, standalone facilities, as you can imagine, are probably pretty expensive, but it's certainly something we should be uh, considering down the line. It, it, it's, uh, Two, two groups that we really have to reach out to. I don't know if that answered your question, but um, we certainly need to do that. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for considering it. And I hope you put that on your list of things for the future because I believe that it's really, really necessary, especially when we're looking at suicide rates. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for the presentation. I think we are done with questions on the for, for just the presentation. Um, so we are gonna go ahead and move on to our bills. As a reminder to committee members, um, we do have two bills that we're gonna be looking at um, left for today. So we're gonna go ahead and start with AB 36. Um, we'll go ahead and open up the hearing on AB 36, which revises provisions relating to veterans. Uh, Chair Torres, uh, Director Wagger, for the record, uh, appreciate that. Uh, this presentation is on Assembly Bill 36, a department bill approved by the governor's office. Uh, the intention of this bill has got five parts, and I want to provide a breakdown of each of those uh, parts. Uh, the first intention is to add certain members to the Interagency Council on Veterans Affairs. Unfortunately, the chair could not be with us today. I am vice chair of the ICVA as well as director of NDVS. Uh, there's three agencies we'd like to add to the ICVA, and that's the attorney general, the superintendent of public instruction, and the executive director of the governor's office of workforce in, uh, innovations. Uh, the second uh, intention of this bill revises certain data uh, submitted to the ICVA. Uh, this is under 4170194, Section 2. Uh, D is uh, the total number of veterans service officers who are employed. We want to add the language employed by the state. Uh, as currently it says all veteran service officers, and we have a, a hard time sometimes uh, keeping track and getting information from the veteran service organizations that have veteran service officers, and they're like, why do we have to share that with the state? And that was a good question. So this would make it state employees and work. Uh, NDVS is very happy to share that information. The other one is the uh, 11B. 
ICVA is asking that this data request be removed. Uh, the latest report provided under 11B resulted in a 54-page addendum uh, to the ICVA report to the governor and the LCB. The adjutant general indicated that if the uh, governor or any legislator wants to know the numbers of National Guard members in a specific drug district, he'd gladly provide that one-on-one. -on -one. Um, the next intent is to remove requirement for ICVA to develop and administer a fellowship program. ICVA has no personnel and no finance uh, to develop and administer, administer any fellowship program. A fellowship program would need to be developed and administered by a state agency providing funds that were available. The next provision is this request is uh, revising the time period re pertaining to reports under NRS 4170195, sections 3.7 and section 4.8. Currently, ICVA is required to report each calendar year and must be submitted on or before February 15th of each numbered year, even numbered year. The ICVA, with the assistance of NDVS personnel, must gather information from each member department within 45 days, compile it, then submit it with the ICVA's chair, uh, chair's final approval. Allowing report to be based on fiscal year, as the rest of the state is, which is a normal time frame, the ICVA would then permit the ICVA members to report by the end of November for the previous fiscal year and allow compilation of these reports more time for organizing and clarification prior to submitting on or before February 15th of each even numbered year. The next intent is revising the duties of the Women Veterans Advisory Committee. Uh, language regarding the Green Zone Network in NRS 417-330 is obsolete and is now done through the Nevada Transition Assistance Program, so we're asking for that language to be removed. Also under Section 5.1c, the language regarding who to inform of the role that the women play in armed forces of the United States is better defined by using community rather than pupils, business leaders, and educators. I don't know a lot of people that use pupils anymore, uh, but we'd like to expand that to the whole community. Uh, Section 5.1e uh, may be removed as it's already in statute that the WVAC will submit on or before February 15th of each even number a year under section 5.3 uh, so there's no need to do an annual report when they already have a requirement to do biannual. Section 5.3 uh, currently states that the Women Veterans Advisory Committee will support a report, submit a report on or before February 15th uh, concerning activities of the committee during the preceding two calendar years. Again, just like the ICVA, uh, they want to make that a uh, ICVA uh, uh, report to the ICVA uh, I'm sorry for every fiscal year uh, for the fiscal year preceding uh, it's also requested that the report be sent to the director of NDVS or any other offices uh, of the state that may be appropriate uh, chair Torres uh, vice chair Duran and members of the committee this ends the presentation on AB 36 I stand for questions Thank you. At this time, I'll open it up for any questions from the committee. Okay, so I'll move into Silva. Thank you, uh, Chair Torres. Uh, thank you again for your presentation, uh, Director Wagner. I, had, I, had, I, had, I was looking over the bill uh, last night, and I had one question. So I know that we're looking at expanding the, uh, the actual uh, uh, membership on the, uh, the, uh, the board for the IBCBA. And uh, my question was, is what about the Secretary of State's office? I know there's been uh, s several uh, veterans groups, veterans who, who have asked for a stronger relationship between specifically the veterans community and the Secretary of State's uh, office, particularly in regards to the, 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 uh, the Secretary's management of the business portfolio of our state. And uh, I'm, I, I was just asking if that's something that has been taken into consideration. Director Weiger, for the record, uh, thank you for the question. I appreciate it. Uh, that is something we can certainly uh, address at the uh, next uh, meeting we have and, uh, and ask the members if they 
feel that the uh, Secretary of State should be added as well. Not a bad idea. It's, uh, uh, they're, they're very important in what veterans do in the state and have regulations that do control, for instance, uh, elections and that kind of thing for uh, service members serving overseas, et cetera. So uh, thank you for the, uh, the comment, and we'll certainly take that under consideration. Thank you, sir. Chair. Sure. Thank you. And I know Assemblyman MacArthur is actually working on a bill that will have to do with Secretary of State and business licensing fees and veterans. So that might be a good place for them to have that conversation in the future. Uh, and any other questions from committee members? Okay, I do have a couple questions myself. So I'm looking at section two, um, and I noticed that you had stated um, that we wanted to amend the report so that the report only required um, the total number of veteran service officers who are employed by the state. Um, however, as I see the language, um, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, as, I, as I'm reading it, it says who are employed by the state and located in the state. So I think it would actually require both data points. Um, is that the intent or was the intent to only capture those employed? Uh, Madam Chair, Fred Weiger, or Director Weiger for the record. Uh, we do want to make sure it's people located in the state. So we don't have any state VSOs located in other states at this point, but uh, uh, we, we want to make sure that they're located here in Nevada. Okay, thank you. And I'm going to go ahead and go to legal. Thank you, Madam Chair, Asher Killian, Committee Council. And yes, since um, the, the and is employed here. This would only be reporting the number of VSOs to which both the condition that they're employed by the state and that they are located in the state apply. So it would be one number of VSOs to which both of those conditions apply. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I just want to make sure that that, that record is very clear for us. I'm also looking at page five of the bill um, where we are striking um, is the members of the Nevada National Guard identified by military, occupational, specialty, and zip code. And, and I'm, I have a couple questions on this section. So the first one is, where is this report traditionally sent? Uh, Madam Chair, Director Weiger, for the record, this is sent to the Governor's Office and the LCB, Legislative Council Bureau. Thank, thank you. And I do think... Um, I do think that report actually might still be necessary because my understanding is that LCB puts out the reports for legislators regularly, um, and that information included require, does list the amount of service members per district um, in that like the demographics of our um, region. So it's all it is necessary information. So this would add an extra step to legal counsel bureau um, because it would require them them to go request it from the 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 general, and that might just be a, a, another step. So I'm not sure that we want to strike this. Madam Chair, Director Wagner, for the record, I understand the concern. Uh, however, if you've looked at the report, it's extremely complicated to even figure out who's got what. Uh, it's uh, 770 or 57? 57. 57-page 57 report, uh, but it's got it's just not a well put together report uh, we've uh, tried to figure out how they can get it another way but at this point it's it's just extremely difficult and if uh, if a uh, assembly person or a senator a member of the legislative body wants to request anything for their district they're more than welcome to do so uh, general Barry has indicated that uh, he'd be more willing to provide that uh, probably in a much better format than what this is. Thank you, and I think we're going to do some research offline too to see if that report, uh, like if the, that information from that report is used for other information right now. I believe it might be, so we're going to check um, with uh, with our team too to see if legal counsel is using that report or if it, or if they're not. What we we can do to kind of clarify. I understand the concerns, but I also want to make sure that the information is still readily available um, to our to legislators as well as the general public. Um, are there any other questions from committees? Or? Okay, I'll go to Assemblyman Taylor. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and, and, and thank you so much, Director. I think you just alluded to it, but my question wanted to ensure, ensure to see if the tag had weighed in on this. Uh, Director Weiger, for the record, thank you for the question. Uh, yes, I, I've talked to General Barry personally, and, uh, and he says, well, why are we even giving that report? We can 
give it to them if they need it on an individual basis and we wouldn't have to try and figure out how we can do this 57 page report every year or every other year so yes he has weighed in on it and he, he's in full agreement to remove the language okay. thank you director thank you chair thank you vice chair duran thank you and thank you for your report so i was just uh wondering on page seven you were eliminating number five basically why is that going to be eliminated or the purpose of that director wagger for the record uh thank you for the question uh and you said uh, page seven uh, this is the Women Veterans Advisory Committee. Uh, is that correct? I believe so. It's section three, number five, develop and administer a fellowship program to increase research on improving outcomes for veterans and servicemen and servicewomen in their families, including without limitation, the areas of education, employment, and wellness. The program must include without limitation publication of peer reviewed materials on annual conferences. So I was just wondering what was the reasoning or your thought process of eliminating that section? Uh, Director Wagger, for the record, thank you for the question, ma'am. Ma um, the fact is that the, the um, ICVA, the Interagency Council on Veterans Affairs, has no employees. It has no finances. It doesn't have a budget. And so uh, in order that for them to develop an administer a fellowship program they would need employees to do that they would need uh, a budget to have somebody to do that and the uh, legislature uh, can certainly uh, ask another agency that they feel that fellowship pertains to um, can do that but uh, they don't have any people to do a fellowship program so how that got into the language in the first place we're not sure but the icva would like that removed because they just don't have the ability and resources to do that does that answer your question ma'am kind of uh can i follow up please with this language and i was just wondering wasn't this probably approved for a budget prior to this i'm just trying to understand if this was already in statute there was no uh, budget approved for this part of it director Wager for the record thank you for the question uh, I would have to go back and look at the original bill and I'm not sure when that was what year that was uh, or why that was put into this without allowing a budget and uh, uh, personnel to do that I, I I'm unaware of any of that And I do think that our legal counsel is actually looking for some of that information for us right now. Um, but if you have an additional question, and then if it's a question better suited for legal, I think we can come back with an answer um, once he's ready for us. So would that be an elimination <laughs> of this whole process right here? Would it go to a different department? Or do you have any plans to try to keep this program in place? If there's an agency that wants, to, uh, Director Wagger for the record, if there's an agency that wants to develop a fellowship pro uh, program or it, administer it in their area, um, Department of Health and Human Services, Department of Veterans Services, whoever, uh, they, they are free to do that if they have the budget and the personnel to do that. The whole point of removing this from the ICVA is they don't have a budget or personnel. They have committee members who are from different agencies but we do not have uh, any administrative assistance we don't have anybody to actually administer a program like this uh, so it would fall to agencies within the state thank you i appreciate that and then i'm going to go ahead and go to our legal counsel Thank you, Madam Chair. Asher Killian, Committee Council. So this requirement, it looks like it was added in 2015 by AB 482. Um, at the time, it appears the Office of um, Veteran Services submitted a fiscal note that it would have no budgetary impact, so I don't believe any additional funding was appropriated at that time, but 2015 is when that was added. 
Thank you. I appreciate that. And I, I think that's a conversation that we can have and I, I might want to continue having because I understand the, 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 the inability to, co to work on that program if, there, if there's nobody to work on that program. Um, are there any additional questions? All right, thank you so much for the presentation. Director uh, Wagger, for the record, just uh, so you know, if you need any uh, assistance, if there's something NDBS can do, we'll certainly help out. Thank you, and I think um, I, we'll probably set up a meeting in the near future with yourself, myself, um, and anybody who else who would kind of like to work on the, the bill before we kind of uh, hear it for a work session. At this time, I will go ahead and um, invite support. I know you all are camped up there, but I do want to give the opportunity for us to have testimony in support of this bill. Thank you. We'll go ahead and hear from Carson City first, and then we'll go to Las. Actually, it looks like Las Vegas might be ready. So is there anybody willing, uh, wishing to testify in support in Las Vegas? Thank you. Anybody in Carson City? Uh, Madam Chair and committee members, for the record, my name is Andrew Lee Pilbit. I am the chairman of the United Veterans Legislative Council for the state of Nevada, and I have been since 2019. Uh, we represent the 219,000 veterans that uh, Director Wagner just shared with you. However, we're going to uh, give you a different number because the 2020 census said we had 8.9% percent of our population were veterans. Well, 8.9% is 279,000 veterans in the state of Nevada. So we've been working on that for a lot of years, the NDVS and us, trying to get that number because we have a lot of veterans who do not consider themselves veterans, uh, both men and women. And as Mr. Wagger has said, it's because they didn't get deployed in the combat zone. I'm a combat infantry officer from Vietnam, so now you know I'm older than MacArthur. So, <laughs> <laughs> so there is one old guy in the room. Um, anyway, um, based on that census and the 279,000 in this state, um, being nearly 9% of our population, when you take into account their families as well, direct families, that's over a half a million Nevadans in the state that are either a veteran or directly veteran connected. So 16% of our population. So a significant group. We're here today to support uh, AB 36. We agree with the updates, changes, and language, uh, and including the fellowship, unless it's funded and staffed, it's not a it's just something that you can't do. So we need to change the statute, and I think NDVS have done that properly, and we support it. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Is there anybody else wishing to testify in public comment in the room? All right, uh, BPS, is there anybody on the line? Testify in support of AB 36. Please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Again, if you wish to testify in support, please press star 9. Chair, there are no callers in support at this time. Thank you. Um, is there anybody wishing to testify in opposition to this bill? AB 36 here in Las Vegas, or in Carson City. BPS, is there anybody wishing to testify in opposition in, on the phone? To testify in opposition of AB 36, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Again, if you wish to testify in opposition, please press star nine. Chair, we have no callers for opposition at this time. Is there anybody wishing to testify in neutral? Here in Carson City, I don't see anyone. In Las Vegas, I don't see anyone. BPS, is there anyone wishing to testify in neutral on the phone? 
To testify in neutral for AB 36, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Again, if you wish to testify in neutral, please press star nine now. Chair, we have no callers for neutral at this time. Thank you. At this time, I'll go ahead and invite you up if you have any closing remarks for AB 36. If not, I can open the hearing on the next one. All right. At this time there, none. Thank you so much for your presentation on AB 36. I will now open the hearing on AB 44, which revises provisions relating to services for veterans. Madam Madam Chair and members of the Assembly Committee on Veterans Affairs, this presentation is on Assembly Bill 44 uh, as approved by the Governor's Office. This uh, in intention of this bill has five parts as well. I'll provide a breakdown of each of those parts. The first section of this bill has to do with the titles of my deputy directors. Internally, for about two years, NDVS has changed what we call our deputy directors compared to how NRS 417.030 currently describes those titles. We are requesting that our deputy director of programs and services be changed in statute to deputy director of benefits and our deputy director of health and wellness be changed to deputy director of health care services. These titles better reflect the broad range of duties our deputy directors have they also align with our federal partners at the Department of Veterans Affairs as we address issues in both categories. Secondly, there are times when language in NRS is no longer correct. This is the case with NRS 417.090. We are requesting that the words adjusted compensation be removed. This is a term that is no longer used with our partners at the Veterans Benefits Administration. There is disability, disability compensation and pension, which are the two monetary benefits still afforded veterans. These two benefits uh, are still listed in NRS 417.090. This is simply a cleanup portion of AB 44. The next section is uh, NRS 417-0901-R. Uh, it was proper when there were few volunteers in our program. Our Nevada Veteran Advocate Volunteer Program has now surpassed 920 volunteers. Uh, NDVS has 17 veteran service officers. Uh, it is unrealistic to, eat, uh, to uh, have each VSO be assigned 54 volunteers to mentor. Uh, NDVS currently provides annual training to these volunteers, once in the north and once in the south. Those volunteers who want more mentorship receive that assistance through our Veteran Advocacy Support Team Office. The supervisor determines what assistance is needed and assigns a subject matter expert to assist those individuals. This has been proven to be much more efficient and volunteers receive the assistance they need. I should mention that all volunteers uh, are not necessarily active volunteers. Many take that course, uh, but we do want to mentor anybody who needs that assistance uh, or ask additional questions. Uh, Madam Chair and members of the committee, this is the last portion of AB 44. NDVS currently provides training to our state veteran service officers on a monthly basis. The purpose of this request is twofold. One is to ensure that NDVS continues at least quarterly training. Well, like I said, we do it monthly now, but at least quarterly training into the future. NDVS has also offered this training to accredited veteran service officers from accredited veteran service organizations, as discussed with Assemblyman De Silva earlier. We have been offering this training to those VSOs for the last two years and this program has been very, very successful. And uh, uh, we want to continue that, but we want to change how we're addressing people. Uh, but we do have a great work in the relationship and we have members uh, I know from VFW, uh, American Legion and DAV, I believe Paralyzed Veterans of America, uh, 
they don't have, you know, it's a voluntary basis, so they come when they want to, uh, but they let us know ahead of time that they are. I think the VFW Department of Veteran Service Officer here in Reno uh, attend, has attended every, every month that we've had it, so uh, we're glad to support our veteran service organizations. Uh, Chair Torres and Vice Chair Duran and members of the committee, this ends the presentation on AB 44, and I stand for questions. Thank you, Director. Uh, and just a reminder to committee members that the amendment has also been posted on Nellis and is available under the exhibits um, for members of the committee as well as the general public. Um, at this time, I will go ahead and open it up for questions. Um, the first one I see, Assemblyman Wynn. Thank you, Chair. Um, Director, I just want to make sure that um, on the title changes that you're suggesting to make on Section 1 with uh, one of the um, deputy director going over from health and wellness to health care services. Um, with thoughts behind that, just because you want to be consistent with what's going on in terms of titles, or um, cause I think from my perspective, um, wellness is actually the, the trend now. Folks are actually re retitling their um, initiative and effort in terms of the healthcare world to. Uh, focus on wellness because you know that's pretty much the um, priority, and there are um, meanings, good meanings behind that. So I'm just kind of curious why we're going kind of backwards on this. Director Wagger, for the record, thank you for the question, Assemblyman uh, Assemblyman Win. Uh, we're not going backwards. Uh, in fact, this is expanding what that individual does. They, she still has the wellness programs. Uh, that are done through our uh, uh, our healthcare champion uh, program manager, and so uh, uh, we're not going backwards. She still has this. This actually expands uh, the duties for that uh, deputy director, and so the wellness piece will be there, uh, just like suicide prevention and and all of our other programs that we run are falling under there. It broadens the scope of this individual and correlates much better with what the Department of Veterans Affairs uh, folks are doing. So I, I don't want to get the impression that we're, we're not going to do wellness anymore. We definitely, huge portion of it, um, our homes are part of the wellness. The Deputy Director of Healthcare Services is over the homes. So this doesn't go backwards, I promise. It's going forward and expanding that the duties of that individual, and this encompasses all that expansion. Thank you. A quick follow-up, Chair? Very quickly, Assemblyman Wynn. Thank you. Um, in terms of, of, of coverage, does this uh, de Deputy Director also uh, responsible for mental health, mental health and wellness as well? Director Weiger, for the record, thank you for the question. Yes, it, it, it's including all health care services. Uh, throughout so yes we do uh, we have that through our program managers thank you thank you chair uh, Samuel Gonzalez did you have a question <clears throat> sorry <laughs> Cecilia Gonzalez Assembly District 16 for the record um, I was just curious with the amendment um, it says that the director will train each service officer, and I was curious, um, how many personnel is that? And I'm sorry if I missed that. Thank you. Director Weiger, for the record, uh, thank you for the question. The state has 17 state veteran service officers, uh, and then the groups, uh, or the organizations have uh, several as well. Not that many, but we wanna make sure that we uh, provide that training uh, at least quarterly to them. Uh, uh, the uh, reason for the amendment was that when it came out in the bill, it says such training must be provided by the veteran service organizations located in the state. It's not the veteran service organization providing the training, it's us providing them training. So that's why the amend uh, amendment was there. Thank you. Thank you. Assemblyman De Silva. Thank, thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, before I ask my question, I just wanted to recognize very quickly uh, Mr. LaPelbit here. I think it's very important for us to know uh, 
This man's a service to this country, one of our most decorated veterans in this state, recipient of multiple uh, Purple Hearts and the Army Distinguished Cross, which is the second highest award that our military bestows uh, underneath, directly underneath the Medal of Honor. So thank you. So it's, it really is an honor to have you here, Mr. LaPelbit. Uh, my question to you, uh, uh, Director Wagner, is the, uh, the, the term adjusted compensation. This is more of an education sort of a you know, point for me. Uh, what, what did that term originally mean, and uh, why are we looking at removing it from the uh, NRS? Uh, Director Weiger, for the record, uh, great question. Um, first of all, regarding Andy, he's amazing, and he's actually heading up the uh, Veterans and Military Day at the legislature on uh, March 15th, just so I can get that plug in there. And so uh, I appreciate all the work he's doing, and he's coordinating with us, so that's great. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, the question... Shouldn't have gone with Andy. I forgot the question. Uh, <laughs> yeah, comp adjusted compensation. Uh, I've been in this business for 20-some years, and I've never heard that term until I saw it in legislation here in, in NRS. Um, we, as far as I was with VA, I was a VA employee uh, working for Veterans Benefits Administration. Never used the adjusted compensation. I looked it up, and there is no such terminology in the Veterans Benefits Administration. We have compensation, disability compensation, and we have disability pension. There is no adjusted compensation within, uh, so I, I don't know if legal has a term or, or uh, anything to say about that, but uh, the fact is that I can't find anything in VBA that would address adjusted compensation. It's probably a terminology uh, from back in the 40s or whenever that started, so. Uh, but I don't have an answer for you, and I apologize. Thank you. And just due to time restraint, I'm going to ask if legal can, when, once that answer is found, if you want to take the, oh, you already found it. Thank you, Madam Chair, Asher Killian Community Council. Yeah, I think that language dates back to when this is sec section originated back in the 1940s, so I think it may have been an archaic term that's just no longer in use. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Seeing no additional questions, I am going to go ahead and open it up for testimony. Uh, is there anybody? Okay. I see a couple people here in Crescent City. Thank you. Chair Torres and, Chair Torres and committee members, for the record, my name is Andrew LaPelvet. I'm the chairman of the United Veterans Legislative Council, and I won't go through that whole thing about how many vets we have. I'll stick with the uh, census, 279,000 veterans in the state of Nevada. And uh, again, this is cleaning up our uh, statutes, and we're in support of this bill. Thank you. Thank you, and I do want to recognize, too, that in the audience we have uh, a couple other veterans that have joined you, um, and, and thank you for your service, and thank you for your commitment to ensuring that we expand services for veterans here in the state of Nevada. Uh, is there anybody wishing to testify in support in Las Vegas? And is there anybody wishing to testify in support, uh, BPS on the phone? Testify in support of AB44. Please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, we have no callers in support at this time. Thank you. Is there anybody wishing to testify in opposition here in Carson City or in Las Vegas or on the phone? I don't see anybody here in Las Vegas, in Carson City or in Las Vegas. Is there anybody on the phone? To testify in opposition of AB44, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, we have no callers in opposition at this time. And is there anybody wishing to testify uh, in neutral anywhere, either in Carson City or in Las Vegas? NBPS, is there anyone on the phone? 
To testify on neutral for AB44, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, we have no callers wishing to testify in neutral at this time. Thank you. All right. Um, do, Director Wagner, do you have any other remarks? Uh, Director Wagner, for the record, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first of all, I want to apologize if I lost control of this uh, group, but uh, uh, I appreciate being here, and I, I want to especially thank the veterans on your committee. Uh, it's great to have the, uh, the vets here, and uh, I've known uh, some of them and known uh, MacArthur for a while now and appreciate everything he's done for vets and, and, uh, and of course, the other two. So thank you very much. And while you're here, I have to ask, did you know that Assemblyman MacArthur is famous on TikTok? Madam Chair, Director Way, for the record, I had no idea. <laughs> I'm not on TikTok, so. You learn just a little something every single day. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, ma'am. Thank you, uh, and thank you for coming to for your presentation of the bills today. Um, at this time, uh, we will go ahead and open up for public comment. Each person has two minutes to provide testimony. Public comment may be submitted in writing to the committee up to 24 hours after the hearing. Is there anyone in person wishing to give public comment here in Carson City? I apologize, I forgot to close the hearing on AB44, so we are going to go ahead and close the hearing on AB44 as well. I don't see anybody here in uh, Carson City for public comment. Uh, is there anybody in Las Vegas? I don't believe so. And is there anybody wishing to testify in public comment on the phones, BPS? To provide public comment, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Anne Marie Grant, for the record, my brother was 38 years old when he was murdered by Reno police. I'd like to thank the veterans in the room and acknowledge the ones killed by police in Nevada who were veterans that survived war but could not survive police in America. Darren Dyer, 924-22 Marines. David Jeffrey Freeman, 81103 Marines. David Lee Kuhn, 4914 Marines. Efri Julio Soriano, 41116 Army. Eric Scott, 710-2010, Marines, Francis Spivey, 22515, Air Force, Jane, James Wayne Pease, 5720, Navy, John Paul Hamilton, 7109, Army, Kenneth Stafford, 71113, Army, Leon James Buck, 81706, Navy, Lloyd Gerald Nopik, 102718, Navy, Rex Wilson, 10-12-16, Marines. Robert McKinney, 5-10-01, Army. Ronald Neal Joseph, Jr., 6606. Stanley Gibson, 12-12-11, Army. Fabanico, Tommy Isidoro Pertle, 11-30-14, Marines. Tommy Lee Guest, Jr., 8-12-01, Army. And Owen Earl Barton, 116-2020, Veteran. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, is there anybody else wishing to testify in public comment? Chair, the public line is open and working, but there are no additional callers at this time. All right, thank you. As a couple of reminders to the committee, um, tomorrow we will not be meeting in this room. We will be meeting in room 4100. It's a little bit bigger of a room, a lot more comfortable. Um, so please, just as a reminder, don't show up to this room. We're gonna be on the fourth floor in room 4100 tomorrow. Um, I believe we will also have a larger audience. We'll be hearing a bill from our colleague, AB 140, um, from Assemblywoman Thomas tomorrow. Um, additionally, I do wanna let the committee know that um, that AB 26 will not be heard tomorrow. We did receive a letter from the purchasing division wishing to pull that bill. So AB 26 will not be heard tomorrow. Um, and a letter uh, a letter from the, the division will also be posted on Nellis so that you all can review that. Um, it wasn't a decision made by the chair. It was a decision made by that division. Um, are there any comments from any members? Assemblyman MacArthur? 
MacArthur Minute? All right, not today. Uh, thank you so much for, for coming to committee prepared today. At this time, the meeting is adjourned. <laughs>